on the 14th or on the 15th and 16th floors, um, as well as planetarium shows. Uh, you can get the tickets for the planetarium shows after the talk, um, and a number of other demos, um, including a virtual reality tour uh, through space. Um, so unfortunately today, uh, Elisa Alvarez, who was our original speaker, was unable to make it. Um, and so we hope that she'll be able to give another talk uh, in the future, later this year. But for now, um, Natalie Price Jones, who most of you know because she typically emcees um, these Astro Tours events, uh, is going to give us a talk uh, instead. And so uh, Natalie Price Jones is a PhD student here. She's in second year um, and she studies the Milky Way. And so today she'll give us a talk on our own Milky Way galaxy. Okay. How's my volume doing? Am I coming through those speakers at all? Can everyone hear me? I'm seeing thumbs up in the back, excellent. Just give me a moment to start my presentation. And thank you all for humoring me today. It was very unfortunate that Elisa had to step up, but we didn't want to leave you all wanting. I realize the Milky Way doesn't bear a huge amount of similarity to destroying exoplanets, but unfortunately I didn't feel very qualified as Elisa studies exoplanets pretty much 24 seven and I don't. Even though I think they're amazing and awesome, I'd rather talk to you guys about where my heart lives, and all of yours as well, the Milky Way. So I have a picture up here. Who recognizes this picture? There's lots of hands going up. What do you, what do you recognize it as? Help me out. Someone shout it. Can't see that. Can't see that. Oh, you're totally stepping on my toes, sir. <laughs> That was my point to make. <laughs> He's exactly right. So the trick is that I wanted someone to say Milky Way and not ruin my fun, but he's absolutely right. We don't view the Milky Way from this beautiful angle from above, looking at these twirling spiral arms. We get a rather different view of our home. So this is what we'd like to see, <coughs> but this is what we actually see. We're forced to look through all this gas and dust through the center of the disk because that's where the sun is. We're out in one of those spiral arms, unable to get a clear view. Fortunately, we have more than just our eyes at our disposal to examine the Milky Way. Those of you who've come to a few of our talks will recognize the electromagnetic spectrum. Indeed, those of you who have ever encountered the electromagnetic spectrum in any context will recognize it. And I've added here just some diagrams that unfortunately this projector cannot render. But we've got little cartoons of things that are approximately the right size for the wavelength of that particular light. So in the radio wavelength, we see 10 to the 3 meters, so kilometer sized things. I don't think many buildings are really kilometer sized, but that's about the scale we're talking about. We move over into the microwave, we get sort of meter sized things like human beings. And on down the scale, things like protozoa, molecules, atoms and atomic nuclei, so moving to smaller and smaller wavelengths and higher and higher frequencies. And these different frequencies along the electromagnetic spectrum allow us to see different parts of our galaxy, to probe different material and investigate different problems. So if we start at the low end of the scale, I'll just keep it up there for reference, we see the radio sky. So I've highlighted it, it's not very clear up there, but hopefully you can all see it. And this is data that I actually made this afternoon from a free set of data that was released by the Planck satellite. This is about a meter in wavelength, so if we're going by our chart, it really belongs more in the microwave, but astronomers call this radio. And we can see there's this bright source right in the middle, in the center of our galactic plane, and diffuse radiation around. So yellow means more radio, purple means less radio. And the radio sky is good for a lot of reasons. It allows us to see this very thin disk through our galaxy because the radio sky is always dark. It's easy to observe. If you've ever seen a radio telescope, you've seen those huge, massive dishes. We have one in Ontario in Algonquin Park. It's a 30 meter dish. And the sun is not particularly bright in the radio. Most of its light is coming from the visible light, which when you think about it makes sense for us evolutionarily because that's the kind of light we see. But it does have a small tail in the radio, not nearly enough to drown out the light from the galaxy like it is to drown out the visible light from the galaxy. This feature right in the center here is an object called Sagittarius A star, and it's a supermassive black hole. It's emitting radio radiation, not by itself, because we know no light escapes any black hole, but the material around it is emitting in those radio waves. It's a very bright source. 
If we move on up through the wavelengths, we can learn even more about our galaxy. Microwave is a very popular one, especially for public talks, because it's in that oh-so-holy cosmic microwave background that tells us so much about the beginning of the universe. This is actually a composite image of several different wavelengths that I wrote down, so I would not forget to tell you what they were. Uh, of about one centimeter to about 0.4 millimeters. So we're very quickly coming out of the range of human macroscopic things. One centimeter, uh, 0.4 millimeters. Things are getting very small very quickly, and we're only on level two. I'll just highlight our microwave wavelengths up there. So because this is a composite image, you're seeing a few different things. In the background, these speckles are what we know as the cosmic microwave background. They're normally not visible, but they've been brought up in their contrast so that we can see them, as well as all this crazy microwave radiation that's coming from the galaxy. Another famous source in the microwave sky is called a periton. Has anyone heard of peritons? No one's laughing, so I assume not. It's a fun science-y name for a very interesting phenomenon that uh, researchers noticed at the Parkes Telescope. They were seeing these strange bursts of microwave emission, and they couldn't pinpoint them on the sky very well. They couldn't explain where they were coming from. But it turns out, when you look in these macroscopic wavelengths that humans interact with, you run into problems. And in this case, the problem was the lunchroom microwave. <laughs> So occasionally astronomers do run into trouble seeing their sky, but most of the time we get lovely images like this. Let's continue stepping forward to the infrared. This is my favorite. This is the data that I work with, so I'm slightly biased. Although this data isn't data I work with, it's from a mission called ACARI, and it's a full sky survey. You're seeing here, this is the far infrared, so still sort of on the longer end of the wavelength scale, but by long we mean honeybee size, pinpoint size, not very long at all. And this is a few different wavelengths, again, sort of overlapped over each other. We can see the galaxy, it's always bright in the middle, because we have just so many sources that are emitting radiation across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Even if those sources are not emitting a particularly large amount in the infrared, we're still going to see them just because there's so many of them. But one thing we don't see that we did see in the visible is the dust that's between us and the center of the galaxy. Infrared is a favorite of astronomers, and the next image will really show you why, but I wanted to highlight here sort of S-shape. There's a blue S-shape. I'm not sure if it's coming through very well on the projector. And I was wondering if anybody had any idea why there's a weird S in the sky. It's not Superman. <laughs> I tried that one already. I wish it was. So it's a function of actually the way that we're looking at the galaxy. This S is dust from the solar system, which someone, I think someone murmured solar system out there, but unfortunately I have a mic and you don't. Uh, whoever you are, you are right. And it's because when we look in the sky, the Milky Way doesn't appear as a nice plane in front of us. It's a function of the way that we're doing this projection. We've taken what is a sphere around us and stretched it into an oval shape. And when we do that, the fact that the solar system doesn't entirely line up leaves us with this cool S of dust in our solar system. But if we step a little bit further into the near-infrared, all that dust is gone. So the near-infrared is really the wavelengths I study. I study not full sky images, but spectra of individual stars. And I use these near-infrared wavelengths. But you can see it's great for astronomers. If I could show people pictures of the Milky Way, this would be the one I'd pick out of all the ones I'm going to show you today. Because I just think it's amazing how much that dust goes away. You can still see it a little bit in the center there. But almost entirely all of that dust is no longer visible. So this is a picture that was taken with the two micron all sky survey. And when I say picture, I mean many pictures stitched together. I don't think it's possible to take a picture of the whole sky like that. And so it allows us to see sort of cooler stars that emit preferentially in infrared wavelengths, and in particular red stars. Near infrared, red's in the name, it sort of makes sense. Those big stars, even though they're hot when they're on the main sequence, when they're going through the part of their lifetime that the sun is in now, as they grow off the main sequence, they cool and puff up and get large atmospheres, and that makes them glow much brighter in the infrared than any other color. We move on now to the ones that are most familiar. Again, we're going to this visible picture. I have a slightly different visual picture for you this time around. This is actually a very old picture of the galaxy from 1955 from the Lund Observatory. And I do like my astronomy history. I think it's very important to see how far we've come as a science. And this picture really highlights it because I don't know if I could have made this picture. It's done by researchers mapping individually 7,000 stars onto the coordinates of the galaxy. 
7,000 individual stars used to figure out what does the Milky Way look like, what's the shape of it in our sky. Today we have much better pictures, although they're not picked up as well by my projector. Uh, and part of that is, again, these dust lanes have now come back and they're here to stay. They're going to obscure the center of the galaxy for us in the visual, and that's why we need to step out to other sources again. This is an all-sky map in ultraviolet, it's the near ultraviolet. I also have the far ultraviolet, they're very similar. But it's interesting here because the center of the galaxy is so bright that we've actually had to cover it up in order to see what's going on in the outer edges. And we can see around very bright stars, we're seeing little orange halos around them. And this is because those stars are so hot and so bright, they're emitting photons that scatter off the dust around them and light up the sky around them. Normally dust is dark. It's dark at least at these wavelengths because it's not emitting much light of its own. It's only scattering off of other people. So we rely on these young stars to really show us that dusty night sky. We're almost finished stepping through our spectrum now. This is an image from the ROSAT survey. I want to pronounce this for you, but I'm going to check because it's German. Uh, Rotgen Satellit. I'm, I'm fairly optimistic. It's named after the German scientist who discovered X-rays and won a Nobel Prize for it, which is very aptly named indeed. We've got a few different colors here again colors in the sense that they're x-ray colors. So the red, blue, and green all come from different bands in the x-rays, different uh, sets of x-ray wavelengths that we've chosen to filter out or filter in. And in this case, we're now down to the scale of nanometers. So we're looking down at atoms here. That's a billionth of a meter. So we're now down to the very small scales indeed. But fear not, we're going to get even smaller. This is our gamma ray sky. It's actually, the Milky Way has gotten quite small in the middle there, small and orange, but there are these bright point sources around. That's because in the gamma rays, we also see pulsars. And I would love to tell you more about pulsars, but you should come to our talk next month where you will hear about them in much more detail. This is energies that are over a thousand, or a, sorry, a billion times what it takes for a hydrogen atom to jump up between energy levels. We're talking about incredible energies here. And if we were to scale down the contrast of this picture, we would actually see bubbles coming up from above and below the Milky Way, these X-ray bubbles, sources still unknown. There's a few other ways we can look at the galaxy. I'm going to hop on to this one. This is a, a really amazing map that came out of the Planck survey recently that's tracing the magnetic fields in our galaxy. And when we think about magnetic fields on Earth, maybe we think of the dipolar magnet, where things are sort of coming out of the top, nicely going into the bottom following nice smooth curves, but you can see that's nothing like the case in the galaxy. We have lots of magnetic fields even just in the solar system. Each star is likely to have its own magnetic field, and the galaxy itself has an overall magnetic field that these, uh, this light is tracing. It's an, kind of an interesting way of mapping it, so these kind of windy looking things are telling us the direction, and the strength is given by the colors in the background. So light is not the only way we can learn about our galaxy. I wanted to add an awesome slide on uh, gravitational waves, which many of you will have heard about in the news. I didn't quite have time to get to it, but that's again another way that's not light. It's telling us about what's going on in our galaxy. So let's get back to our galaxy. We've been looking at those pictures of the sky for a long time, and astronomers have looked at them for even longer, and use them to deconstruct from that two-dimensional view into a three-dimensional model. This is an artist's conception, as we said at the beginning, where we can see those hot stars forming that we saw in the UV, those hot blue stars forming along these spiral arms. The red regions are tracing just where the star formation is just starting. This is tracing hydrogen gas as it starts to form up. If we zoom in a little bit here, we're going to see that the sun is about here. It's about halfway out from the middle on a region of the galaxy called the Orion Spur. We have a few arms around the Scutum Centaurus arm, Perseus arm, and the Sagittarius arm. And if you'd like to get into debates about what those arms actually are and where they go, you're welcome to. Any astronomer who tells you that they're well-defined is probably trying to defend a thesis. Uh, <laughs> they're a bit, as you can see, it's, it's hard to say exactly where one ends and the other begins. You can definitely trace out that blue and red and say, well, there's, there's got to be an arm there, but 
is it connected to that arm? There's, there's some dust in between, but it's not entirely clear. So there's still a lot of debate about what our galaxy would actually look like exactly because of this problem that we're stuck in the middle of it. So if anyone wants to volunteer to go on an extremely long space mission and go look from the top, scientists would probably be willing to help you out. We've got this central region, this central bar. Some scientists think that there might be two bars that are slightly misaligned with each other, the central bar and the long bar. Inside that, you've got a bulge, and somewhere in the middle there is that Sagittarius A star, that supermassive black hole living at the center of our galaxy, just hidden in the middle there. All of this material that we've been looking at from the top lives in the thin and thick disk of our galaxy, which are pretty much exactly what they sound like. The thin disk is thin, the thick disk is thick. And above those and around them is a spherical halo. So we've got this disk shape with the spiral arms and the spherical halo out around them where we see globular clusters and also streams from galaxies that we think might have been eaten by the Milky Way, pulled apart by the tidal <coughs> gravity. Also in that halo and distributed throughout the galaxy is dark matter. Once again, a talk in itself that many of you on your feedback forums are requesting. Uh, and we do try and talk about it a little every time, but the sad thing is we are just waiting to be able to tell you what it is. <laughs> and I have no new revelations on that front. But the search goes on for dark matter. So this is our close-up of the galaxy. So what's actually happening? How did we get to our galaxy? We've got a nice life cycle here. Let's, let's sort of zoom in a bit. So most things related to do with stars or with planets are involving clouds of gas. So we start out with a cloud of gas and dust. I didn't put dust, but it's there. And it begins to collapse downward under gravity. There are a few reasons this could happen. There might be some movement within the gas that eventually causes it to collapse. It might be shocked by an external supernova that goes off. That shock from the supernova traveling out through the gas and starting collapse, sort of kick-starting it. Whatever the cause, the cloud doesn't look like this. We think it looks a little bit more like this. So this is the Perseus giant molecular cloud. We name things really well in this case. Sometimes astronomers get our names wrong, but this is a giant cloud made out of molecular hydrogen. We did it. We named it right. So you can see here, it's not a big sphere shape at all. It's got all these long filaments, sort of like feathery material coming off. And you can actually see here a few bright spots, a few cores where stars are starting to form. And that's the key. Even though we see this long uh, filamentary structure, we're still seeing stars form in clusters around these cores. So we've got the stars forming. We start with a really big guy. He takes up all the mass for everyone else. We have a few more stars form of varying sizes, and they form, again, in a shape we're familiar with, whoop, in this disk shape. So we've got dust and gas and a protostar in the center. Things collapse downwards under gravity. Perhaps planets form out of this disk. And in the end, we end up with a group of stars. This group of stars all formed from the same initial material. They're drawing from that same gas cloud. But they're not alone. They're in a galaxy full of other stars. And as time goes on, those stars don't stay together. They start to get pulled on by the gravity of other giant molecular clouds, of groups of dust, of groups of other stars, and they start to blend in with other groups of stars. And I've given them different colors here, not just because I enjoy the primary colors, but more importantly because it's to indicate that these stars came from different initial clouds. And that means that those initial clouds will have different compositions, different elemental makeups. So the elements of the periodic table, I'm sure all of you can call the periodic table to mind, right? He's having nightmares about grade 9 science. I had to memorize it in grade 9 science. It was no good. But those elements are important for us as astronomers in order to determine where these stars formed. So they're all spread out now throughout the galaxy, no longer together, no longer easy to identify as a group of stars that formed together. And over time, those most massive stars, they live fast, they die young, and they start exploding. And as they explode, they're adding the material, not only the material that they were made of when they started, but all the material that they created over their lifetime through nuclear fusion. They're adding that to the clouds of gas around them. And the cycle begins anew. This supernova goes off, and out of the ashes, new stars start to form. Those new stars, again, are a different color because they're, again, a different composition. They've been formed out of this cloud of gas that couldn't have been at the start because it needed the elements that were made in this large star in order to form. So this is the crux of my research. Ha, I tricked you. I'm going to talk about my work. 
It's every, every researcher's dream to talk about their work. My work is looking at those near-infrared pictures of stars and trying to determine what elements they're made of and hopefully use that to trace back to the initial cluster from which they formed. If you can do that, if you can do that for enough stars in the galaxy, you can start to trace back star formation history. You can say that this cluster formed before this cluster because there wasn't enough material from a supernova that you needed to go off. You had to have one cluster form first, then a supernova, then you can have the other cluster. Otherwise, the elemental abundances don't add up. But it turns out when you do this, especially on a large scale, you start to find interlopers. You start to find people who don't quite belong. And by people, I mean stars. I like to think of them as my friends. It's a very lonely life as a grad student. <laughs> Where do these stars come from? How can we have stars that don't make sense in our star formation history? Stars that can't be explained by the way our supernova go off. That doesn't, that doesn't quite add up. But if you were listening closely, and if I remembered to say it earlier, I mentioned that in the halo of our galaxy, we see tidal streams from other galaxies that our galaxy may have devoured. It's time to talk about galaxy cannibalism. <laughs> This would have been a really great slide to have like a cannibalism thing, but this is when I about ran out of time to make slides. But I can definitely explain it for you. We know from simulations, we can simulate the early universe pretty well, that galaxies form much like stars do. They form out of large clouds of gas and dust, much larger clouds of gas and dust, starting to coalesce, starting to rotate in disks, starting to form stars within those disks. That's how we get our galaxy. The process of star formation I just described is how our galaxy keeps being a galaxy. It's how it keeps those blue star forming spirals. But when we do this, we know from our star formation that there should be a group of galaxies forming together. And some of you may have heard of the local group, and there's quite a few galaxies that are nearby to us and are gravitationally bound to us. We're orbiting all around together. But that's not nearly as many as we would predict from his theories, and this is called the missing satellite problem. The Milky Way is missing its satellites. And so the proposed explanation for these interloper stars is that they once belonged to separate galaxies that had separate star formation histories, separate processes of supernova going off and enriching gas around them with new elements and then starting to form stars again. Whole separate evolution of stars. And so when we see them in our galaxy, they don't make sense, but they make sense if they formed somewhere else. And so part of my work is to deconstruct how many of those galaxies do we eat? Can we explain the fact that our simulations don't predict the right number of satellite galaxies if the Milky Way just devoured them all? And again, I say devoured because it's much more dramatic, but really what happens is that slowly over billions of years, a satellite galaxy orbits around the Milky Way. It's in that gravitational potential. It can't quite hold itself together against the power and starts to get smeared out throughout the sky. Maybe the core of it goes through the Milky Way itself. N stars never touching, but the gravitational potential is so extreme that the Milky Way grabs a few of the stars on the way by, steals it for its gravitational potential. That's my work. And I mentioned the local group. That was a real spin. I'm sorry if anyone got motion sick. There are some people, some neighbors nearby, there's with the people again, uh, who we could devour now. And these are two prime targets, the Magellanic Clouds. They're actually one of the furthest objects that you can see with the naked eye, not, definitely not the farthest, but they're something that is outside our galaxy when most of our naked eye objects are stars within our galaxy. And we've got a large one, the large Magellanic Cloud, and a small one, a small Magellanic Cloud. They're both dwarf irregular galaxies, and the large Magellanic Cloud used to be purely dwarf irregular until scientists discovered some structure that you can't quite see there that looks like it might have been a bar and maybe a spiral arm at some point. So the large Magellanic Cloud is already paying for hanging out so close to the Milky Way. It's starting to be disrupted by our gravity. It's no longer that lovely spiral shape that it might have had early on. And the small Magellanic Cloud can't even be deconstructed because it's so small it's just a completely irregular shape. There are a few other targets, although they're further away. Barnard's galaxy here, where again we have these, these red areas are picking out where we have ionized hydrogen, so crazy star formation going on. And Barnard's galaxy has some weird patterns, especially really far out. It's another sort of dwarf irregular galaxy. They think again that there's a bar structure in there, which might have pointed again that Barnard's galaxy was once more structured than it is today, but gravity always wins. 
Triangulum is the smallest spiral in the local group, so it's still managing to hang on to its structure, and it's almost face-on, which is very useful for studying spiral structure. The Milky Way and Andromeda are disobliging about that. And it too could be a target for us, but it's a little bit on the large side for eating. Nowhere near as bad as Andromeda, though. Many of you will have heard that the end is nigh, and in four billion years, we're gonna collide with Andromeda. And again, no stars will touch, no actual physical collision will happen, but the gravity will spin our two galaxies into one, probably an elliptical or maybe a large disk, depending on the orientation of the impact. Unfortunately, Andromeda is far too large to say that we've been eaten, and we've gone now into galaxy mergers. This is another form of what I'd classify galaxy cannibalism, that they're always evolving and merging with each other, meeting up, tearing apart, and in the corner there, you'll see M32, which is suffering a similar fate to the large Mag Magellanic Cloud around our galaxy. It's actually a dwarf elliptical because it has no structure left. The interactions with the tides in Andromeda have just turned it into a sphere for now. I've added an arrow. I really remember these slides. If you'd like to see more about this galaxy cannibalism and these mergers, or talk to me more about chemical tagging afterwards, the mergers you can do at galaxyzoo.org, which is a crowdsourced website for citizen scientists. They show you an image of a galaxy, you tell them what it looks like. Does it look like a spiral? Does it look like an irregular galaxy? Does it look like an elliptical? Or can you see a merger? Those ones are pretty rare, but I encourage you to go and find out. And I hope I've been a bit edifying today. I'll ha happily take your questions now. In the front. Uh, first, uh, uh, we showed a picture of the, uh, the EMS earlier, the electromagnetic spectrum, and you had the um, you had the wavelength. Um, um, so what would be the wavelength? Um, and you had them compared to like uh, objects like the um, radio waves are are what? The wavelength is as tall as is as tall as uh, is as long as one kilometer, kilometer distance, and um, up to that long. Up, um, 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 I couldn't help but notice that the numbers on the thing were a bit fuzzy for me to understand. That might be an unfortunate feature of the projector. Uh, uh, certainly that was one of the first responses on Google. He's asking about my electromagnetic spectrum image and pointing out that it's just coming through a little bit too fuzzy to read all those small numbers. But I was hoping that it, it would be enough to see the images, which again, were also a bit fuzzy, and just get a sense of the scale that really this is a scale that covers from things that are building size to things that are the size of an atomic nucleus. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. What was the name of the first galaxy we looked at as an example of what our Mercury looks like? So what was... Can I go to home? That might be easier. <coughs> home? This picture. Is this the one you're asking about? This is an artist drawing, so it's no real galaxy that we know of. Yeah? Um, just a basic question. Do we see, like when we look at the sky, do we see any stars that are out of the Milky Way? That's a great question. So he's asking, can we see stars that are not in the Milky Way? So. If you attended our talk on Hubble, you'll know that many of the things that we see in the sky that are point sources are actually very far away galaxies. It's very difficult to see stars outside. But actually, Andromeda is a case, I'll move my cursor, where we can resolve individual stars in this galaxy, which is incredibly useful for us because it's very easy to resolve the stars in the Milky Way and do the kind of chemical study that I would like to do. But in other galaxies, it's challenging. Andromeda is about as far away as we can get and still see individual stars from another galaxy. My question was like, when you look at the sky uh, with your eyes, all the stars that you see, they're all in our Milky Way, right? Everything you see that's a star will be in the Milky Way if you're looking with your naked eye. Yes? I have a small star finder, and it says Andromeda on it. And there's another place close to it that says Andromeda cluster. So so things in the sky are often named for what's near them. So she's saying, uh, in, is this uh, observing software? You're looking at Andromeda. It's just a cardboard. Ah, and it's a cardboard sign that has 
the Andromeda and also the Andromeda cluster nearby. And so when we look at things in the sky, they're often named for whatever they're near. So for example, the galaxy, can I go back? Triangulum is named not because it looks like a triangle, because it doesn't, but that it's in the Triangulum constellation. So this is just a function of, if you want to tell an astronomer, I want you to look at this really cool cluster, and they say, great, where? And you're like, I have a string of numbers, or I could tell you it's near the Andromeda galaxy. That's the reason for that naming convention. I think I'll take one more question, and then I'll let you guys go to get started on planetarium shows in the back. So the question was, where did my big maps of the Milky Way sky from come from? Did they come from the Earth or from space? And why do we have so many telescopes all over the place, you greedy astronomers? So the maps of the sky, for the most part, came from satellites because that's the best place to observe, especially for these all-sky surveys. If you want to be on all the time, it's nice to be up in space where the atmosphere isn't going to bother you. It's not going to rain if you're in the visible. Radio doesn't care about that so much, so there are plenty of radio telescopes on Earth. Um, but in this case, my radio image came from the Planck satellite. I have to quite remember, but I'm almost certain that all of them came from satellites. Uh, the Lund Observatory was also obviously on Earth, and the other visible image that I showed you was taken by um, a citizen scientist who took 51 images of the Milky Way sky with a camera and stitched them together to make that really amazing picture of the whole sky in the uh, visible wavelengths. Why do we have so many telescopes? We can look at more than one thing at a time. Our telescope has Depending on the design of the telescope, we have a limited beam size, so we have a limited amount of the sky that we can look at at any given time, and sometimes interesting things are happening in two places at once. Some of our telescopes are just scanning over the sky all the time looking for flashes, things that go, off and, uh, go on and go off again, and we don't know why. These are called transients. So a really famous type of transient is a supernova, uh, because they're really dramatic and we can see them from Earth. Uh, but there are many other things that go flash in the sky that we don't quite know what they are yet. So we will have these surveys going all the time looking for these objects, generating databases that we can analyze this way. Other reasons to have lots of telescopes, we can do interference between our telescopes. Especially in the radio wavelengths, interferometry is a very popular technique where you use the fact that you have a telescope on one side of the Earth and on the other side and measure the difference in time it takes for a signal to reach them. This is popular with pulsars, which have regular emission cycles. And so if the light from your pulsar reaches one observatory before the other, you can start to pinpoint very precisely where that pulsar is on the sky, even though your wavelengths are the size of kilometers. Those are just a few of the reasons I can think of off the top of my head, but I'm never going to say no to more telescopes. <laughs> I think I'd better wrap up so that we have time to get to the planetarium shows. I'll happily answer your questions down at the front after the talk is over, but I have to switch over to my official announcement slides as I'm wearing two hats today. <coughs> so as usual, even though we have to cut things a little bit short today, we're going to be doing events afterwards. In particular, these planetarium shows I've been harping on a bit so much. Tickets avail will be available for the 9 o'clock, 9.45, and 10 o'clock shows in outside in the hallway just behind this lecture hall. We also have lots of other things going on upstairs at the telescopes. There are signs to guide you up there and also friendly volunteers. If you do pick up a ticket for the 9 o'clock show, you're going to be heading over with Catherine, who's waving at you right now. Remember her face. If you have tickets already bought, for the 9.15 show, you're going to be heading over with Adiv, who's back there. They're go both going to be meeting you downstairs in front of the elevators. And finally, before I let you go for real, I'd like you to just take a moment and fill out your feedback forms. If you have any thoughts, we really appreciate hearing them as a grad student organized event. Thank you all very much for listening, even though I wasn't Elisa.